The Celestine Vision, Chapter 3, Understanding Where We Are When we get up in the morning and look out of our windows, we see the modern world beginning to awaken for the day. Neighbors leave their homes and drive away in their cars for the morning commute to work. Overhead, perhaps, we hear the drone of a plane. A delivery truck full of mass-produced goods rolls by to restock the supersized grocery store down the street. For some of us, the long story of history that ends in this moment of observation is merely a litany of economic and technological progress. But for more of us every day, history is becoming a more psychological question. How did we come to live like this? How was our everyday reality shaped and formed by those who came before us? Why do we believe what we believe? History, of course, is the larger context of our individual lives. Without it, we live only in the superficial and provincial reality we inherited as children. An accurate understanding of history gives our awareness of the world depth and substance. It hovers around all that we see like a frame of meaning that tells us who we are and gives us a reference point for where we seem to be heading. Replacing the Medieval Cosmology The story of our modern, largely Western way of looking at the world begins at least 500 years ago with the collapse of the medieval worldview. As is well known, this old world was characterized and maintained by the central authority of the early Christian church. The church, of course, was largely responsible for rescuing Western civilization from total disintegration after the fall of Rome. But in so doing, the churchmen took upon themselves a great power, defining the purposes of life in Christendom for a millennium based around their interpretations of the Bible. It is difficult to imagine just how little we humans knew in the, mid in the Middle Ages about the physical processes of nature. We had little knowledge of the organs of the body or the biology of plant growth. Thunderstorms were believed to come from angry gods or the designs of the evil spirits. Nature and human life were cast in strictly religious terms. As Ernest Becker discusses in The Structure of Evil, the medieval cosmology placed the earth at the very center of the universe as a great religious theater, which had been created for one great purpose, as the stage on which humankind either won or lost salvation. Everything, the weather, famine, the ravages of disease and war, was created strictly to test one's faith, and there to orchestrate the symphony of temptation was Satan. He was there, the churchman said, to deceive our minds, foil our work, take advantage of our weaknesses, and spoil our bid for eternal happiness. For those who were truly saved, eternity would be spent in the bliss of heaven. For those who failed, who succumbed to the temptations, fate would bring damnation in the lakes of fire, unless, of course, the churchman intervened. The individuals of that day facing such a reality could not go directly to God to seek forgiveness, or even accurately assess whether they were passing the spiritual test, for the churchmen set themselves as the sole gatekeepers to the divine and worked tirelessly to prevent the masses from having direct access to any holy text. If they aspired to eternity in heaven, medieval citizens had no choice but to follow the often complicated and capricious dictates of the powerful church leaders. The reasons for the collapse of this worldview are numerous. Expanding trade brought word of the new cultures and outlooks that threw the medieval cosmology into question. The excesses and extremes of the churchmen eventually undermined the church's credibility. The invention of, of the printing press and distribution among the populations of Europe of both the Bible and the books of antiquity provided information directly to the masses, which in turn led to the Protestant Revolution. A new line of thinkers, Copernicus and Galileo and Kepler, directly challenged the church's dogma concerning the structure of the solar system, the mathematics behind the orbits of the planets, and even mankind's place in the universe. Over time, the belief that the earth lay at the center of the universe was thrown into doubt, and as the Renaissance and the Enlightenment emerged, God was pushed further and further from everyday consciousness. The Anxiety of Lostness here we can see one of the most important historical turning points in the formation of the modern worldview. The medieval worldview, as corrupt as it was, at least defined the whole of existence. It was an agreed upon philosophy that was broad and comprehensive. It established meaning for the complete range of life events, including the reason for our existence 
and the criteria for entering a pleasant, heavenly plane after death. Life was explained in all its dimensions. When the medieval cosmology began to collapse, we humans in the West were thrown into deep confusion concerning the higher existential meaning of our lives. If the churchmen were wrong and untrustworthy, what was the true situation of humankind on this planet? We looked around and realized that in the final analysis, we merely found ourselves here, whirling through space on a planet that circles one of a billion other stars without knowing why. Surely there was some God, some force of creation that put us here for an intended purpose. But now, we were surrounded by doubt and uncertainty, immersed in the angst of meaninglessness. How could we find the courage to live without having a clear idea of a higher purpose? By the 16th century, Western culture was completely in transition. We were a people stuck in a no man's land between world views. The Emergence of Science Eventually, we thought of a solution for our dilemma. Science. We humans might be philosophically lost, but we realized that we could embrace a system through which we could find ourselves again. And this time, we believed it would be a true knowledge. One free of the superstition and dogma that characterized the medieval world. As a culture, we decided to launch a massive inquiry, an organized system of consensus making, to discover the facts of our real situation on this planet. We would empower science and mandate that it go out into this unknown place, the vast natural world, remember, had not even been named, much less explained at that time, to discover what was going on and explain it to the people. Our enthusiasm was so high that we felt that the scientific method could, in fact, even discover the real nature of God, the creative process lying at the heart of the universe. Science could, we believed, marshal the information necessary to give us back the sense of certainty and meaning that we had lost with the collapse of the old cosmology. But the faith we had in a speedy discovery of our true human situation soon proved to be misplaced. To begin with, the church succeeded in pressuring science to focus only on the material world. Many of the early thinkers, including Galileo, were condemned or killed outright by the churchmen. As the Renaissance progressed, an unsteady truce developed. The wounded but still powerful church stubbornly claimed sole providence over the mental and spiritual lives of human beings. Only begrudgingly did it sanction scientific inquiry at all, and the churchmen insisted that science be applied only to the physical universe, the phenomena of stars, orbits, earth, plants, and our bodies. Thankful for the territory, science began to focus on this physical world and quickly flourished. We began to map out the physics behind matter, our geological history, and the dynamics of weather. The parts of the human body were named, and the chemical operations of biological life were investigated. Careful not to pursue any of the implications its discoveries might hold for our religion, science began to exclusively explore our outer world. A materialistic universe. The first broad scientific picture about how this outer world operated was created by Sir Isaac Newton, who pulled together the views of the early astronomers into a model of the universe as stable and predictable. The mathematics of Newton suggested that the larger world operated according to unchanging natural laws, laws that could be counted on and used in practical ways. Descartes had already made the case that the universe in its entirety, the orbiting of the Earth and other planets around the Sun, the circulation of the atmosphere as weather patterns, the interdependency of animal and plant species, all work together like one great cosmic machine or clockworks, always reliable and totally devoid of mystical influence. Newton's mathematics seemed to prove it so, and once this holistic picture was established in physics, Everyone believed that the other disciplines of science had merely to fill in the details, discover the many processes, the smaller levers and springs that made the great clock run. As this began to occur, science became more and more specialized in its approach to mapping out the physical universe, dividing into ever smaller subdivisions, and going into greater detail and naming and explaining the world around us. Cartesian dualism and Newtonian physics established a philosophical position that was quickly embraced 
as the reigning world view for the modern age. This view further advocated an empirical skepticism in which nothing about the universe should be believed unless it was shown by quantitative experiment to exist without question. Following Francis Bacon, science became ever more secular and pragmatic in its orientation and moved further and further away from the deeper issues of mankind's spiritual life and purpose. If pressed, scientists would refer to a deistic notion of God, a deity that first pushed the universe into operation, leaving it ever afterward to operate totally by mechanical means. The Enlightenment Solution We come now to another key turning point in the formation of the modern worldview. We had turned to science to discover the answers to our largest existential and spiritual questions, but science became consumed with a purely secular and material focus. Who could tell how long it would take to discover the higher meaning of human life? Clearly, we in the West needed a new banner of meaning, a new mindset that we could hold on to in the meantime, and more important, one that would occupy our minds. And in this moment, the collective decision seemed to be to turn our attention to the physical world completely, just as science was doing. After all, science was discovering a rich bounty of natural resources, there for the taking. And we could use these resources to improve our economic situation, to make ourselves more comfortable in this secular world of ours. We might have to wait for knowledge about our true spiritual situation, but we could make ourselves more materially secure while we were waiting. Our new philosophy, albeit temporary, was a furtherance of human progress, a commitment to bettering our lives and the lives of our children. At the very least, this new philosophy eased our minds. The sheer weight of the work to be done kept us busy, just as it kept our attention off the fact that the mystery of death, and thus life itself, still loomed large and unexplained. Some day, at the end of our earthly existence, we would have to face the spiritual realities, whatever they were. In the meantime, however, we narrowed our focus to the problems of everyday material existence and tried to make progress itself, personal and collective, the sole reason for our short lives. And that became our psychological stance at the beginning of the modern age. We only have to take a quick look around at the end of the 20th century to see the grand results of this narrow focus on material progress. In a few centuries, we explored the world, founded nations, and created a huge global system of commerce. In addition, our science has conquered diseases, developed awesome forms of communication, and sent men to the moon. Yet all this has been accomplished at a great cost. Citing progress, we have exploited the natural environment almost to the level of destruction. And personally, we could see that at a certain point, our focus on the economic aspects of life became an obsession used to push away the anxiety of uncertainty. We had made secular life and progress ruled by our logic, the sole reality we would allow into our minds. Western culture finally began to awaken from this preoccupation in the mid-20th century. We stopped and looked around and began to understand where we were in history. Ernest Becker won a Pulitzer Prize for his book, The Denial of Death, because he clearly showed what the modern world had done to itself psychologically. We had narrowed our focus to material economics and for so long refused to entertain the idea of a deeper spiritual experience because we didn't want to be reminded of the great mystery that is this life. I believe that's why old people tended to be abandoned in nursing homes. Looking at them reminded us of what we had pushed out of our consciousness. Our need to hide from the mystery that terrified us is also why a belief in the universe where synchronicity and other intuitive abilities are real has felt so foreign to our common sense. Our fear explains why, for so many years, those individuals who were experiencing mysterious synchronicity, intuition, prophetic dreams, ESP, near-death experiences, angelic contact, and all the rest, experiences that have always occurred in human existence, and even continued in the modern age, were met with so much skepticism. Talking about these experiences, 
or even admitting that they were possible, threatened our assumption that the secular world was all there was. Living the Longer Now We can see, then, how our perception of the synchronicity in our lives represents nothing less than a collective awakening from a secular worldview that has lasted for centuries. Now, when we look out on modern existence with its technological marvels, we can see this world from a more revealing psychological vantage point. At the fall of the medieval age, we lost our sense of certainty about who we were and what our existence meant. So we invented a scientific method of inquiry and sent this system out to find the truth of our situation, but science seemed to splinter into a thousand faces, unable to immediately bring back a coherent picture. In response, we pushed away our anxiety by turning our focus to practical endeavors, reduced life to its economic aspects only, and finally entered a collective obsession with the practical material aspects of life. As we have seen, scientists set up a worldview that reinforced this obsession and for many centuries became lost in it themselves. The cost of this limited cosmology was the narrowing of human experience and the repression of our higher spiritual perception, a repression we are finally breaking through now. Our challenge is to hold this perspective on history in our awareness as a matter of practice, especially when the still influential materialism reaches out to lull us back into the old view. We must remember where we are, the truth of the modern age, and make it part of every moment for it is from this larger sense of aliveness that we can open up to the next step in our journey. We can see, once we look with fresh eyes, that science has not completely failed us. There has always been an underlying current in science that was silently moving past the material obsession. Beginning in the first decades of the 20th century, a new wave of thinking began to fashion a more complete description of the universe and ourselves. A description that is finally making its way into popular consciousness.